So the last talk for today's session will be about uh, mainstream monetary and fiscal policies and their theoretical uh, foundations. And in that sense, so we're going to talk about what were the dominant policy uh, prescriptions and how these have been rationalized theoretically uh, at the time and during the global financial crisis. And um, as such, let me make a few comments to start with. So from that point onwards, after putting down well, the mainstream policies and their theoretical foundations, Joe will, Joe, uh, Michelle will pick up tomorrow and talk about their uh, problems in terms of policy uh, prescription, I mean in practice, and also alternative policies that can be uh, um, engineered in order to take us out of this, of this, um, of this uh, prolonged recessions essentially. And another point that perhaps is good to make from the beginning is that um, there will be pretty much no connection with the previous discussions of today. <laughs> <laughs> and there will be no connection, particularly because in mainstream macroeconomic theorizing, there's always been this divide among um, not only the real and the monetary sphere, but also this divide between money as understood at the macro level and finance as understood at the micro level. And this is a divide that um, essentially excludes this discussion and analysis of whatever was being undertaken until now. But, uh, so yes, I'm making that clear from the beginning that we're not going to see that. Uh, but we will see what are the implications of actually not taking into consideration how the financial sector is operating. Uh, now, to talk about the rationalization or of the mainstream uh, macro policies, we need first uh, to situate them within the overarching uh, macroeconomic theory that essentially offers the conceptualization of the economic system and its functioning, because it is only through that that we can then understand if there is a role for state inter intervention, and if so, then what it is and how it can actually affect the macroeconomic system. So I'm going to start off with a very brief um, journey in the evolution of macroeconomic theory uh, that will help us, I hope, understand uh, what is, what was the predominant um, conceptualization of the economic system at the time of the crisis, what we're going to be calling here the new consensus macroeconomics, which is, goes by with many different names, such as new Keynesian DSG modeling or the new neoclassical synthesis and so on. So we're going to follow a little bit the journey on how we reach there and um, then we're going to put down what is the main, um, how the macroeconomic system is understood within this framework, and hence uh, what policy, what is the role, the scope, and the capacity of macroeconomic uh, policy uh, intervention to play a role within that system. Okay. Um, so, but I'll do this very briefly so that then we focus on the on the the contemporary aspects. So in the pre-Keynesian neoclassical paradigm, uh, the macroeconomic, well, the economic system was actually um, understood with the separation between the real and the money, or the finance sphere, what is known as the classical dichotomy, whereby money operates as a veil in the sense that the equilibrium of the economic system is given by the uh, real side, the supply side, full employment position of the economy, and um, money is only there to play the role of determining absolute values after relative values and real variables have been essentially um, 
found to be at their equilibrium levels. And within this setting, therefore, all markets clear, clear, we are at full employment, and whatever discrepancy might ever arise between demand and supplies or savings and investment, it's viewed as either temporary or as caused by institutional impediments to that. Uh, not least, let's say, um, minimum wages being there and not uh, allowing the real wage to, to move down. And within such a conceptualization of the economic system, clearly there is no scope for policy intervention. So we cannot talk about monetary and fiscal policies because the perfectly working free market is self-equilibrating. And this was exactly the conceptualization of the, of the functioning of the economic system that Keynes uh, sought to attack in the 1930s, um, bringing essentially to the fourth um, um, <clears throat> theoretical innovations that particularly relate to the non-automatic translation of savings into investment. They're all essentially of effective demand and money. And uh, this within um, a macro rather than a microeconomic analysis based on uh, fallacies of composition and fundamental uncertainty. And from that, the main, um, the main theoretical framework that uh, actually survived in mainstream was actually what we call the orthodox Keynesianism that has been popularized through the ISLM, this hydraulic ISLM uh, popularization of Keynes, which essentially allows for the possibility of the economic system um, um, standing at a point of rest, at an equilibrium point in which labor markets will not uh, will not clear, so there, there might exist uh, involuntary unemployment due to deficient demand. And this is particularly explained, again, within the ISLM, and I'm assuming we're all familiar with the ISLM framework. Yes, okay. So within orthodox Keynesianism, involuntary unemployment is essentially understood as uh, breakdowns of the evaluation adjustment mechanism. So it's either because of wage rigidities or because of interest in elastic investment, what we should call the investment trap, or because of the liquidity trap, the absolute uh, liquidity preference. It's because of these rigidities essentially in either the real or the money markets that um, we might end up in a position of insufficient levels of demand uh, and therefore involuntary unemployment. And it is within this conceptualization of the economic system and how it operates that we can talk about monetary and fiscal policies, okay, in the old Keynesian way, these demand management policies that refer to the short run and are essentially attempts to boost the demand side of, of the economy. And, um, and clear, right, and if we are in a position of unemployment or underutilization of resources in general, then within this framework, fiscal policy is understood to affect effective demand directly as uh, being a component of aggregate demand in itself, or then through movements in the IS curve, and the monetary policy is perceived as affecting uh, effective demand indirectly through what is usually called the Keynes effect, essentially through its impact in the money market on the rate of interest, which in turn would affect investment and hence aggregate demand. So this is the orthodox, I mean, the, the orthodox Keynesian understanding of monetary and fiscal policies, uh, where usually one is attached to the IS curve and the other one to the LM curve, and shifts in those two would essentially uh, manage to boost the demand side and bring output. Uh, at its full employment level. And there are, of course, two special cases that have taken um, loads of attention within this framework, the one of the, the investment in the liquidity traps, particularly the latter one uh, that makes monetary policy ineffective because essentially, despite money being thrown into the system, there is this absolute preference for liquidity whereby cash is held rather than 
um, rather than invested in either bonds or in real investment. Now, from that point onwards, um, with the demise essentially of Orthodox Keynesianism in the stagflation period, evolution of macroeconomic theory from that point onwards kind of takes us back to this pre Keynesian neoclassical um, approach, even if it is in steps. So, so the first counter revolution comes from monetarism, and particularly Friedman's monetarism that is bringing back the notion of the self-equilibrating system, even if that is now only in the long run, uh, whereby the economy will be at its natural position, its natural rate of unemployment story that is determined from the real supply side of the economy. And clearly, monetary policy uh, cannot affect that natural position unless and only in the short run and only at the expense of ever accelerating inflation. So this is the monetarist idea that uh, money supply is at the end. A, a inflation is at the end a, 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 monetary, a monetary phenomenon. Uh, and we have like the first transformation on what should the policy intervention be, in which case monetary policy is viewed not as an authority-based uh, demand uh, management policy, but rather should be understood in terms of following a rule, following a rule-based um, uh, policy, let's say keeping the money growth at a specific percent at all time. And monetarism is essentially bringing forth the first um, uh, the first step into the neglect of fiscal policy by either through arguments of crowding out, even more so 100% crowding out stories, or because of these long internal lags and so on. So fiscal policy is essentially slowly being, um, being neglected um, through these crowding out arguments that essentially say that even if we increase government, uh, spending because uh, that would essentially increase real interest rates that would then be crowding out investment. So what we would be having is a recomposition in our aggregate demand rather than a boost in aggregate demand. And that's how fiscal policy is slowly becoming c considered to be um, ineffective or neutral or not having an effect. Now the next attack uh, comes from new classical economics and its extreme real business cycle alter ego that is essentially um, bringing in well, particularly the notion of rational expectations and instantaneous clearing markets. So now we've got markets that are perfectly working instantaneously and we've got agents that have rational forward-looking expectations and the main um, argument when it comes to policy intervention is the well-known policy and efficacy proposition that is essentially saying that um, systematic policy intervention, state intervention will have no effect as it will be always countervailed by the actions of rational agents. Now we're going back to this structural, structural model. So this is Lucas' critique, essentially. And it can only be through shocks, surprise policies that we might have an impact, temporary impact, on the real side of the economy. And uh, real business cycle theories is actually taking this conceptualization of the economic system one step even further by um, essentially talking about policy irrelevance. So it's not only that it is uh, inefficient, it is irrelevant, it's undesirable, and it is actually unnecessary. Uh, because, <clears throat> well, because this is a theoretical framework that understands um, understands business cycle fluctuations in the short run as essentially equilibrium positions at all times, and this is achieved with three consolidations or three resolutions that have been at the core of all sorts of debates throughout the theory <coughs> of um, of macroeconomics which is essentially the short-run, long-run division, the macro-micro, and the monetary real. 
spheres. And the, um, the resolution that the real business cycle is bringing in is essentially a consolidation of short run to long run. So at any point in time, we are in an equilibrium long run position. Uh, micro, macroeconomics is um, converges completely on micro through general equilibrium um, theories and also there is a pure exclusion of the monetary side so there is no money that's why they're called real business cycle models because money is purely a nominal variable that will have no impact neither in the long run but nor in the short run. So money is super neutral, there is no money, there is no demand side uh, problems, and there is no macro <coughs> uh, as something separate from microeconomics, um, which then implies that uh, we should perceive the economic system in a dynamic uh, setting, and that would give us an economic system as a moving Valrasian real side general equilibrium uh, that is derived purely from microeconomic principles and fundamentals. Which means, in simple words, that the system as a whole is nothing else but the summation of the representative individuals that are optimizing at any point in time, intra and particularly intertemporally, and then business cycle fluctuations cannot longer be understood as deviations from any sort of a long run position or a potential output or things like that, but rather what we actually observe as fluctuations in our GDP is the potential output moving around itself because of exogenous shocks. So recessions essentially are not because actually they are uh, their optimal responses to uh, an exogenous shock, to bad luck, let's say. Recessions are not situation of involuntary unemployment. Uh, people are optimizing intertemporally and therefore they are optimally withdrawing hours of work um, or withdraw themselves from the labor force. And we can then think of recessions as, gre or great recessions as um, great vacations. Yeah. Um, so that is the, the fundamental understanding of the economic system under real business cycle theory. Uh, that is quite extreme because, of course, it. Uh, sorry, I have to walk in. Yeah, and it's quite extreme because, first, uh, even without, well, even if unintentionally, it is essentially conceptualization of the economic system that makes uh, the economics prefer profession redundant. Uh, because if everything is optimal and if we're all sitting at equilibrium points, I mean, there is no point for us to sit here and discuss about, about these things. And one would then expect that um, it would not have much of an impact when it comes to policy prescriptions, and actually that could be a theory that would not have much of an impact on macroeconomic theorizing in general. Uh, but that is not true, perhaps not so much when it comes to its policy prescription, which is we should do nothing because we always at our best. But uh, it has had one of the major impacts when it comes to what should the research program of macroeconomic theory be uh, in terms of the aim, what's the aim of macroeconomics, and in terms of the methodology. Um, and I'm going to talk about this within the, the new consensus macroeconomics. Now, of course, this super extreme position of real business cycles has um, created all sorts of responses from um, all sorts of different macro, mainstream macroeconomists that we can nowadays call them New Keynesians and that essentially embraced the, um, the methodological, the methodology and the aim of the New Classical and the RBCs. So they still uh, analyze the economic system from the point of view of methodological individualism and 
uh, axiomatic mathematical formalization, but their initial attempt was at least to essentially try to explain um, periods, let's say, of unemployment, even within a setting of rational expectations uh, and so on. And this is predominantly being brought into with theoretical innovations at the micro level when it comes to market imperfections. So they're bringing ma they are bringing in market imperfections within the same um, analytical framework. From this super bored New Keynesian palette, um, some particular aspects are being brought together with pretty much whatever was going on before, meaning together with monetarism, with the new classicals, and with the RBCs, to then form what we call the new consensus macroeconomics or the new synthesis. Now, this new synthesis, this new consensus, again, is accepting much more from what came before rather than reject. Uh, so it continues to think of the system as a dynamic general equilibrium system uh, derived from micro foundations that is buffeted by exogenous shocks, but it brings in two main differences. It brings in a separation between the short run and the long run, pretty much in the same vein as it was with the old uh, ISLM story, whereby uh, in the long run, everything is working perfectly and our, the equilibrium, the potential position, the natural position of the, of the economy is given by the real side equilibrium. Uh, but in the short run, it could well be that some prices are sticky. So there could be a deviation <coughs> of the short run from the long run. Now, price stickiness is therefore one of the main uh, differences from the RBC models that can only be, and it's being brought as an assumption, of course, and it can only be rationalized if we make one other assumption that plays not the role but that, uh, which is the assumption of monopolistic competition in goods market. So essentially we need to have firms not being price um, takers. We need to move away from per perfect competition in order to be able to give a micro foundations for uh, prices being sticky for some firms essentially uh, not deciding not to change their prices in the short term. So these are the two main deviations essentially from the new classicals and the real business cycle theory. Uh, and the fundamental assumption here is price stickiness. Now this assumption within an otherwise um, similar macroeconomic setting has two implications. It <clears throat> uh, essentially reintroduces a scope and a role for monetary policy, only for monetary policy intervention. And it also, uh, this assumption also brings the, um, the means, the capacity for, uh, for monetary policy to do so. so. So in a nutshell, okay, the long run position is always at its best. So we're at potential output, full employment. But in the short run, because of some price stickiness, uh, the responses to exogenous shocks will not be optimal. So there will be a deviation between the long run and the short run um, in response to exogenous shocks. And it is because of that that policy intervention can step in to stabilize the system. And that can only happen through monetary policy. And that can only happen because prices are sticky. Right. Is that all clear or not clear? OK. So, and fiscal policy is pretty much non-existent in this story, as is the financial sector, by the way. So monetary policy within this mainstream uh, new consensus, macro, is understood to operate within the form of, of a Taylor rule. This is a feedback rule uh, that essentially prescribes how the central bank should adjust its policy instrument, which is the nominal rate of interest, the policy rate. So how should that policy rate be adjusted in order to meet its policy targets and its 
policy targets are essentially established by well, the primacy of price stability, um, but also stabilizing the economy around its long run position. And within this setting, money is also supposedly endogenized money supply, so we kind of move away from the old ISLM story that we're controlling money supply. Uh, but this is more in token rather than in essence, because real because new consensus macro models are pretty much non-monetary models. Um, and I'm not going to talk more about this point because I think Joe will bring that up tomorrow, the endogenous story. So, very, very simple. Okay, uh, very, very simply, we can see how monetary policy is viewed to operate in this model by looking at the three key reduced form equations of an otherwise huge DSG model behind those three equations that we're not going to go through for obvious reasons. But essentially, what we've got is a kind of a New Keynesian IS kind of curve, a New Keynesian kind of Phillips curve, and essentially the monetary policy rule. And the monetary policy mechanism actually represents and, and will show to us okay, how this economic structure is, is supposed to operate. Okay. So, yes. So, first of all, <clears throat> We have a Taylor rule that is saying that the central bank should be moving its nominal rate of interest whenever inflation is deviating from its target or whenever output is deviating from potential output, from full employment, long run, uh, fully flexible prices output that we would get. And whenever there are deviations between uh, those two gaps, let's say, because of exogenous shocks, right? These are models that explain, the, that explain fluctuations because of, exo of exogenous shocks rather than endogenous instabilities. So let's say for whatever reason that output, current output is above potential, so the economy is overheating, and also that inflation is above its inflation target. What would then uh, monetary policy, the Taylor rule should tell us to do is to increase the nominal rate of interest. Now, if we increase the nominal rate of interest, that would translate into an increase in the real rate of interest because there is price stickiness. Otherwise, it wouldn't, and there would be no scope for monetary policy. But because some prices are sticky, the real expected rate of interest will increase. Now, a, a real expected uh, interest rate going up would, through an IS curve, essentially choke out investment or consumption uh, and that would essentially be reducing um, aggregate demand or closing the gap between actual and potential output. And through this closing gap, uh, together with commitment to controlling inflation, via um, <clears throat> essentially controlling inflation expectations, we're going to have current inflation going down through the Phillips curve because the output gap is closing and because uh, inflation expectations are contained. So this is pretty much how the system works. And the opposite, of course, when there is a shock that moves uh, current output below full employment or inflation below the target rate. So in that case, so whenever we are in some sort of a recession, let's say what the central bank should do is reduce the nominal interest rate which would bring the real interest rate down, which will increase consumption and investment through the aggregate demand, and that would boost output and inflation. And that's pretty much the response that, let's say, central banks followed uh, in the aftermath of uh, the uh, current of the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. So actually, what central banks did is they brought, uh, they brought their, pol their policy rates pretty much to minimal levels, right? Um, so these interest rates were brought down again. Okay, there is a one transmission mechanism in this story. So very low interest rates boost aggregate demand. 
uh, in reality, they, I mean, most of the new Keynesian models do not have investment behind. So consumption plays the role of investment and consumption at the same time. It's as if consumption goods and investment goods are the same thing. So a lower interest rate, okay, would essentially, because we are intertemporal, intertemporal maximizers, a lower interest rate would actually m make us want to um, consume more today and will be boosting demand as such. But suppose there was an investment there as well. So a lower rate of interest would be boosting up investment and demand. So interest rates were pretty much brought to minimal levels and the, recessions, the recession continued. And it was at that point that more unconventional monetary policy was adopted by the Fed or the, um, the Bank of England and much later by the ECB as well, which comes by the name of quantitative easing, yes? Which essentially um, was central bank directly buying uh, assets from financial institutions. Now, quantitative easing in practice, of course, preceded whatever theoretical rationalization could be made out of quantitative easing. Because up until that point, the main policy instrument for monetary policy was the rate of interest. And one of the realities that were exposed by this financial crisis was what we nowadays call the zero lower bound problem. So the zero lower bound problem uh, is essentially a problem that um, has not been well thought in the mathematical models of, okay, what happens if the nominal rate of interest is brought to zero? What do we do next? Yes. So in a sense, okay, in the model it would be, what will happen if I have to end up in a corner solution rather than an interior solution? The zero lower bound problem is essentially the question of how effective is monetary policy when the interest rate is brought to zero. Yeah. And despite the fact that it has been in many occasions connected with uh, the liquidity trap, the old liquidity trap story, and QE being essentially portrayed as a solution to the liquidity trap, this is really not the case. Yes. The liquidity trap is essentially referring to that position where there is absolute liquidity preference. So whereby whatever money is throwing in, we are actually hoarding it rather than using it. Um, and that is very different than whether the rate, where the rate of interest is situated, whether it's zero or one or minus one. Uh, and it has nothing to do with this new unconventional policy measure, which is understood theoretically at least as going back to old monetarism. Let's just throw more money in, yes. And despite all this QE, the recession persisted and the um, banks were essentially um, not willing to extend, to extend credit. So QE cannot be thought as a solution essentially to a liquidity trap. And the new consensus macro does not have space to understand the liquidity trap. Because one of the things that they did in relation to the, um, in relation to the old ISLM story is to replace the LM curve with an interest rate function, with a Taylor rule, which would um, then imply that there is no money demand, there is no liquidity preference. There is no such channel in these models, so they cannot explain liquidity traps. At least they could not explain liquidity traps up until the crisis, okay? Um, so that is one point uh, about uh, QE and its theoretical rationale. Now, how about the financial sector? And let's see. Yeah, why we haven't talked about it at all? Uh, the main reason for this is because the financial sphere is actually non-existent in pretty much most macro models. And again, this comes very, this has very deep uh, traditions and um, it essentially relates to this divide whereby at the macro level, finance becomes money demand and money supply. 
and it's only at the micro that uh, finance is supposed to be um, to be connected with the allocation of resources to most productive um, to most uh, productive projects, essentially. So first of all, yes, there is no meaningful financial sphere within these macro models. And this is predominantly driven by this convention, conventional wisdom that monetary stability would have financial stability as a byproduct. Or in other words, okay, and was one of the justification for the non-incorporation of financial system within these DSG models has been that um, First of all, the banking sector, banks operate as, as neutral financial intermediators. All they do is they take savings and turn them into investment. That's all they do. And that the financial sector per se is most efficient in its allocative role of scarce resources to the most productive uh, projects, which is nothing else but the efficiency market hypothesis. Then, within such an understanding of the financial sector, um, the dominant macroeconomic theory at the time of the financial crisis could not uh, shed any light to questions such as why would a collapse in an asset market, let's say, in a housing market, could have an impact on real activity? And it cannot shed any uh, light on questions of <coughs> the sort, why uh, would these large losses of financial institutions have real effects? So these are, these, our macro theory at that time could not answer these kind of questions. And the fundamental reason for that is because, because it uh, precluded the asking of these questions. So these are models that cannot ask these questions because they are excluded from the beginning. Yeah. And this is reflected in all sorts of, um, essentially, the mathematical assumptions which underline the um, theoretical presumptions of the new consensus uh, macroeconomics. And it can go on with many different um, weird names. But the fundamental assumption that does not allow for these sort of questions to be asked are the representative agent paradigm that um, that is indeed <coughs> is a much much stronger assumption than efficiency market hypothesis. The representative agent paradigm is essentially saying that we're all a bunch of different people and we are forming the economic system but we can be represented by as if we are one household. For us, as an economic system, right, for us actually heterogeneous people to be thought as a one representative, that would necessarily imply that, um, first of all, we have complete mass markets and we have perfect risk sharing amongst each other, yes. This also implies that for every asset there is a corresponding liability. So if, if uh, asset prices, housing prices go up, right? Um, for me that it, it is an asset, I'm better off. For you that it is a liability, you are worse off. But at the aggregate, at the representative agent level, there will always be net wealth effects. And that's why these are theories that, that cannot explain why. Uh, asset markets collapsing should have an impact at the aggregate real economy. Uh, again, that we can have complete current and future markets and pure perfect risk sharing for us to be represented as one, this necessarily implies that there exist all sorts of different um, promissory notes, okay, uh, that in these models are called Arodebro securities. There exist all sorts of these promissory notes that we can trade freely with each other of the form that, shall something bad happen to me, you will bail me out and I'll do the same for you. Uh, shall I lose my job, you can provide me with an employment benefit and I will do the same for you. 
So we are essentially uh, perfect. We are sharing risk privately, perfectly among each other, because we can essentially enumerate all the possible states of the world, individual states of the world, okay, not aggregate shocks, not systemic shocks. Uh, and we can essentially share the risk among each other. Which then, by definition, okay, these plus transversality conditions that we're always imposing in these dynamic models, essentially imply that by assumption, we are um, not allowing for default, bankruptcy, insolvency, and liquidity problems to ever show up. Yes. So the representative agent paradigm is something that goes beyond on whether we can think of whether it is a good or a bad first approximation or abstraction of reality to think of the economic system in terms of one aggregate average person. Yes. It goes beyond that because as soon as we make that assumption, we are pretty much shutting down all those um, all those effects that uh, can be brought in by all sorts of different crises. Um, and of course, this has been also one of the main um, um, weaknesses yes, uh, of the new consensus macro, of the dominant uh, macroeconomic theory at the time of the crisis. And by many new Keynesians, it was um, it was a well-accepted criticism and self-reflection that indeed we do not have a meaningful banking sector in our models and we have no meaningful financial sector uh, in our models. And there have been attempts to essentially reconcile this uh, divide, right, between money at the macro level and finance at the macro, at the micro, and whatever malfunctionings can be taking place at the finance, financial sector level. But in most cases, uh, and I'm not going to discuss these uh, models, but in most cases, okay, the incorporation, this bringing back in uh, a financial sector uh, into these models that was never there, is done pretty much within the same framework and within the same conceptualization of the workings of the economic system which essentially necessarily implies that the nature and the form of the financial sector included into these models would be, um, would be uh, problematic per se. Because you have to move away from a representative agent paradigm to be able to. And you have to move away from all sorts of other issues essentially. The shorter and long run divide. Um, uh, and this uh, consolidation to micro uh, principles, if one is to, I don't know, understand in a macro theoretical framework what we were discussing in the morning and in the afternoon. Okay, so this is on the financial sector or lack of the financial sector in the new consensus macro. How about fiscal policy? Um, okay, fiscal policy has also been excluded from the new consensus macroeconomic framework. Um, <clears throat> again, I mean, this was done in, um, well, it took some time to actually take place, uh, starting off from monetarism, but by the time that we reached to the new Keynesian DSG, uh, modeling fiscal policy is completely out of the picture. It is only therefore monetary policy that can play the role that we describe through a Taylor rule or a QE uh, if the interest rate reaches zero and that's pretty much it. So with fiscal policy non-existent again uh, in this in the dominant macro uh, framework at the time of the crisis, how can we then what are the theoretical, essentially, foundations for the uh, proposed uh, austere fiscal policies? So austerity, uh, so the argument in favor of austerity, essentially, of austere fiscal policies cannot come from the new consensus macro model because there is no fiscal policy in this model. It can, however, well, it has, it, it has 
being supported by a set of more or less quite neoclassical arguments uh, that have been showing up at different points in time in a piecemeal uh, basis. Um, now, why austerity? The main focus of austerity fiscal policy, this essentially means to um, well, focus on the government budget constraint and on the funding gaps right, of, of the government. Particularly then the focus is on, um, uh, on reducing deficits or bringing down uh, debt to GDP uh, ratios. Which in terms of how it can be done in terms of policy, there can be whatever policy mix between reducing government um, expenditure or increasing uh, taxes and so on and so forth. Now, the main idea behind this austerity or the, the main rationale behind austerity policy comes from essentially the advantages of reducing budget deficits and debt. Uh, this has, of course, a very long history in, um, in the international financial institution uh, propositions, well, particularly the IMF and whatever conditionality programs has been uh, devised for countries um, with uh, external debt problems and nowadays with domestic debt problems as well. But the main idea is that governments should have balanced uh, budgets and deficits because this reduces the probability of um, <coughs> sovereign debt crisis uh, like in Greece, and it provides support to these debt sustainability arguments because sound public finances are essentially enhancing individual and investors' confidence, and therefore sound public finances contribute to sustainable growth in private consumption and investment. So then sustainability and stability and growth essentially reinforce one another. Okay? That's the main rationale behind these austerity policies. Now, when it comes to <coughs> when it comes to why is it a good thing? So why is austerity, why may austerity has positive effects? Or essentially these theories that have been popularized a lot with Alessina in the last few years all these expansionary fiscal contractions. So we can grow through shrinking. Now, the main arguments that have, been, again, okay, these are theoretical arguments that have been introduced in piecemeal, but they've been, the whole discussion has been very much empirical because there is no integrated theoretical model that um, can put down this argument for austere fiscal policies. But there are bits and pieces that essentially uh, have to do with, um, first of all, crowding in effects, okay, which is the opposite of crowding out. So if we reduce government spending, that would then reduce interest rates. And that would then boost private investment and the efficient allocation of resources that we are assuming that it always taking place, as opposed, of course, to an inefficient allocation of resources by the state. So that's the one argument, the crowding in story, that takes place through the rate of interest, which is pretty much exactly the main trans transmission mechanism of monetary policy, yes, in the macro consensus. So it's all through rates of interest. Then is this new Ricardian equivalence idea that would tell us that if a reduction in government spending today uh, would be credible, then us as, again, as rational uh, individuals that are maximizing intertemporally, we would then conceive this reduction of government spending today as a corresponding reduction in whatever uh, future taxation we might have to pay. And if we do so through our intertemporal optimization, we may boost our consumption today. Um, Yes. Now, this is an argument that does not necessarily work through interest rates, but predominantly it works through um, um, expectations, okay, and confidence 
that in the future, because we're going to have this sound financial uh, position, we will not have to pay that much taxes, so we might as well consume more today. Um, and, okay, there's the new, uh, the last, well, whatever, channel or theoretical con contribution that connects public austerity with the boom of domestic competitiveness. Uh, so it is not only through the rates of interest, but it could also be through um, devaluation of exchange rates. Now this can happen either directly, i.e. if we, I don't know, cut jobs in the public sector that would then reduce uh, wages and will directly boost our competitiveness because prices might go down, uh, or indirectly, um, if then government expenditure is reduced, then domestic demand will be suppressed and firms might go looking for sales abroad, and this is how we actually are uh, reducing imports and we are increasing exports. An export kind of led um, story that can be brought in by fiscal austerity. So these, are, these have always been the, the, the main arguments in favor of, of, um, of these expansions through contraption. And of course, Oh yes, I put it last, but it's all right. And of course, within this whole story, uh, we have to very much downplay um, the negative Keynesian multiplier, right? The direct effect on aggregate demand of reducing government spending, actually reducing aggregate demand directly. And uh, that might have a big negative multiplier, particularly in um, situations of... Um, recessionary situations where there is lots of unemployment or in general underutilization of resources. So we need to, to, to downplay the direct channel so that um, the arguments in favor of austerity can be brought up. But in the same uh, token, and um, Joe will discuss these things much more tomorrow, so I'm only going to put um, some of the problems that do come out from this from these arguments. Yes, I mean, even if this crowding in effect or this competitiveness story uh, is to to work, it might. If we are to to believe that reduction in the government spending will uh, reduce rates of interest and that can boost investment, um, that might expect to operate. Uh, in situations where there is a scope for the rate of interest to go down, yes. Um, it is very much indeed unlikely for this to happen in a situation where rates of interest are, nominal rate of interest are close to zero and loads of real interest rates are already negative. Um, I'm, I'm not even going to discuss the recurring equivalence because uh, the recording equivalence. Yeah, the recording equivalence has never seemed to be. To, has very, very weak theoretical and empirical basis. Um, but it's the same when it comes to depressing domestic demand to be able then to uh, grow through exports. Uh, but how can that then operate in an environment of a global financial, of a global crisis essentially? So if we all start exporting, depressing our domestic demand and exporting, for instance, uh, which is pretty much what Germany is doing. So if all countries are doing that, to whom are they then exporting? Yeah. Uh, and um, so yes, this is one of the main debates that goes around to this austerity, this story that austerity is the way out, actually, um, of this uh, crisis. But I leave it to that, because Joe will pick it up from point tomorrow. And that's it. No questions. Oh, questions. Okay, sure.